Okay, let's see if this works. We're having a lot of issues with static echoing. Okay, let's see. Let's add her back on. So I'm adding Carly back on. Oh, come on, don't do this. So they're saying that everything was echoing on, on my end. Okay. Can you hear me? I could hear you just fine. Great. I moved to the other side of the room, so maybe there wouldn't be as much of an echo. Okay. Okay, Brittany and Bosch and those that are watching, how do we sound now? They're saying so far so good. Brittany says good so far. Sherry says so far so good. Okay, guys, if I sound great, then we're going to go ahead with this interview. My husband just tried calling me. I had to deny his call. <laughs> he knows. I told him, you know, I do Facebook Live every Thursday at 8. Hey, Barb. How are you, sweetheart? How do we sound? Does everything sound good? So we could go ahead. I can introduce Carly. She could start sharing her story. Think it's okay. Okay, Suzanne said, think it's okay. Oh, and by the way, so, so far, so good. Okay, Basha, thank you. Suzanne, when do you leave to Maui? I know you say you leave in November. When in November? Better. Okay, Lori said better. Good. Okay. All right, so we could get started. So, guys, I want to introduce you to Carly. Um, she, I haven't met her personally yet. But she is my Facebook sister, my Facebook friend, lung cancer sister. Um, how we became friends on Facebook, who knows? We, you know, we all just. Because you're so great at posting all these facts about lung cancer and advocating for us. I knew I just wanted to be your friend so I could oh, learn oh, more from oh, you. Thank you. She's so sweet, isn't she? Thank you so much. So, so yeah, so she requests me. There you go. She requests to be my friend, and of course, I accept any lung cancer brothers and sisters out there. I accept because they're family. So Carly is a lung cancer survivor. I don't know much. She is going to share her story from beginning to end. She's going to share um, what gives her hope, what is giving her hope now, um, if she does any advocacy work. If not, then we, we got to help her and bring her up up to us with us a right bar right Alyssa we got to show her how to advocate um and so yeah so so she is from what part of Texas are you from Carly Dallas area but right now I live about two hours east of Dallas okay I'm not right, even so. gonna name because there really isn't one nobody would even know I live in the right. middle of the middle of nowhere. Okay, go to Texas for you I'll be out there I'll be flying out there Sunday with my daughter and my husband. So I'm looking forward to checking out Dallas. I've never been to Dallas, so this is my first time. It's what? It's fun. Dallas is great. It's, yeah, that's what I heard. So I'm looking forward to it. Okay, guys. So here is Carly. So Carly, go ahead and take it away. Okay. So my story starts a little bit before I was diagnosed. Um, like I said, I live out in the middle of nowhere, and it's because my husband, it's because my husband's family had a property out here, and we're on 112 acres, and last October, we had this crazy idea to buy an old 1920s uh, farmhouse church parsonage. Um, and we had it moved out onto the farm. And so starting in October of last year, we were building fences, doing the plumbing work on this house by ourselves. I mean, just doing hard physical labor. And then in December, I got pregnant. And that was so exciting. And up until then, I had been very, very active without a problem at all. I was probably honestly the healthiest I have been my entire life. 
and things had never been better ever i mean things were as good as i think they could have ever been and then in february i started not feeling well um and i talked it up to being exhausted from moving a house and i mean we had to bring electricity out i mean we did everything from scratch um and renovating the house and I just thought I was really, really tired from that, being pregnant. Mm -hmm. I was on a new medicine because one of my hormone levels was low, and that can have some weird side effects. Um, I was losing weight, but I had really bad morning sickness. Um, and then I had a little bit of a cough, but my allergies have always been terrible. And I mean, I had been to the doctor seven times mm -hmm. okay and my blood work was always fine my doctor thought i was fine i thought i was fine so in april i still wasn't feeling well and i started getting a little bit concerned thinking maybe it's more than just mm -hmm. allergies or pregnancy or whatever excuse i thought or you know even my doctors thought um, so I was talking to my mom one day and this was, I've always been a little bit of a hypochondriac and I was <laughs> talking to my mom and I'm like, mom, you don't think I could have lymphoma, do you? And she's like, oh my God, Carly, no, you don't have cancer. <laughs> you have allergies, go take a, like a Claritin, you're fine. And I laughed and I was like, you're right, that's crazy because... I was 25 years old, super healthy, except for this cough, and didn't think anything of it, and so that was maybe a Tuesday, and then I went to her house Friday because she was moving, and I had to go pack up the rest of my childhood and bring it to my new house, and I felt okay, you know, I went up the stairs and it made me tired. But again, I chalked it up to being pregnant, not feeling great. Um, I was never expected. And so we went out to lunch. Um, I did a little bit of shopping because we don't have, we have one gas station where I live. So <laughs> when I go to town, I make the most of it. Um, so I went shopping and the next day was Saturday. And I told my husband, I said, I think I might need to go to the doctor today. Um, my mom had our six, or he was five. So my mom had my five-year-old. Um, I had the opportunity to go. He was like, we really need to work on the house today. And I said, you're right. So we went to Lowe's. We bought a pallet of concrete and a new kitchen sink. And so we spent the day throwing out all the bags of concrete installing a new kitchen sink, repairing a water line. And around 5 p.m., I said, I really, I, I want to go to the doctor. And in my mind, it was bronchitis or something. And as I was sitting in the waiting room, I was Googling what my symptoms could be. And at the very worst, I was like, you know, this might be pneumonia at this point because it's been so long. I didn't feel terribly ill, but I was struggling. Um, so we went to the little walk-in ER, not the, not the emergency room. It was just like an after-hour clinic type place. And we were waiting, and it was a very nice one, and they were offering me back massages. And, <laughs> and um, it was, I thought nothing of it. We had dinner plans in a few hours that we were going <laughs> to pick it up and go home and one of the nurses brought me back and my pulse ox was 78 Ooh. and I didn't know what that meant I had I don't think I had ever paid attention to taking my vitals before other than blood pressure and pulse and my pulse was very high also and I was sitting and it was like one something 
and my pulse box was 78 and my blood pressure was okay. And it was a little bit high. My blood pressure was a little bit high. And I made a comment. I said, that's weird. My blood pressure is never this high. Um, and he's like, um, Pam, your blood pressure is the least of your work right now. Um, I just, I had no idea what that meant. And he said, just have some antibiotics because it's probably He's like, no, we really need to do an x-ray. So they sent the doctor in to talk to me. And um, at this point, nobody even knew I was at the doctor except for my husband. And um, they sent the doctor in. And he's like, you know, we something's not right. This isn't mm -hmm. normal. You shouldn't this way. Your oxygen should be higher. Um, I had, yeah, um, no family history of any sort of problems. And um, they took me and I did the x-ray and he came back in and he's like, you seem to have a really bad case of walking no Okay, this hold on, Carly. Um, they're saying that you sound choppy and trouble hearing you again. Lost, they lost your sound. Can you hear me? Okay, you sound better. So, yeah, so go ahead and continue. Okay. I'll keep an eye. She's back. Okay, yeah, they can hear you now. Like I said, I live in the middle of nowhere, so service can be spotty. <laughs> anyway, so the doctor came in and he said, it looks like you have a really bad case of walking pneumonia. We need to transfer you to a hospital. And that, I'm thinking, oh, you know, this is terrible. Um, uh -huh. I'm being admitted to the hospital. I have things to do. My, I was like, am I going to be out by Monday? I have to take my son to school. I have so much going on. I don't have time. I don't have time to be sick. And he's like, you need to go to the hospital and we can worry about that later. And in my mind still, walking pneumonia was as bad as it was going to be. And I texted my mom, because it was 1 o'clock in the morning at this point. You know how they can be so slow. Um, I texted my mom and I said, you don't need to panic. There's no need to panic. But um, I'm in an ambulance being transferred to a big hospital in Tyler because I have walking pneumonia. But I didn't call her, I didn't wanna wake her up. I was like, just so you know, <laughs> this is how this is going on. Um, I, didn't tell her, I, I didn't tell her that they had me on oxygen and I still, my pulse ox was still really low even though I was on oxygen. I didn't tell her any of that because I didn't, I didn't think it mattered. Um, uh -huh. So I get to the hospital in Tyler, and they put me on, I think it was the seventh floor, and at the time I didn't think anything of it, but it was the oncology floor, and I, I didn't think a thing of it, not a single thing, um, and I asked the nurse, I was like, how, how long am I planning on being here? is I, I feel okay. I feel like I can go home. And she's like, you're not able to breathe on your own. You're not going home anytime soon. And I think at that point, I realized something might be a little bit worse. And I started panicking. And the next day, I had a pulmonologist come in and talk to me. He said, you know, from your x-ray, things things look really severe. Um, we need to talk. And then he started feeling my neck. I was like, oh, are you looking for a lymph node? And he said, yeah, but I don't feel any. And I was like, oh, because it's right here. It was on my collarbone area. I didn't think anything of it. And he's like, 
it's down there. And I said, yeah, you can feel it. And he said, how long has that been there? And I said, maybe three or four weeks. And he is like, we need to, we need to remove that and do a biopsy on that. And um, I was like, oh, okay. And I became pretty concerned at that point. But my sister, oddly enough, had had a, I don't know if it was a lymph node or a cyst, I can't remember now, in the exact same spot in December, so four months before, the exact same spot, she had to have it removed, and it was nothing. It didn't, um, it didn't show for anything. It was just a, a lymph node or a cyst, or I don't remember. So I was still like, oh, it's probably no big deal. And he came back in after the surgery, and he said, it, it's, it's probably cancer. Sorry. Um, That's okay. And I was floored, absolutely floored. I am no family history of cancer. I had absolutely no idea. But at this point, in my mind, I was like, okay, this is probably non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I'm going to do a year of chemo. I'm going to be okay. Nothing's going to change. It's just going to be a little bump in the road. I'm going to be fine. And we're going to move forward. And this is just going to be a terrible, you know, memory of the past. Um, and my mom left to go back to my house because that's where my son was. And my husband, he wasn't, I don't know if he was there or not. I feel like he was at the hospital, but maybe not in the room. And a doctor came in. And she said, you know, and this is like 6 o'clock at night. And she said, we have the preliminary results back from your biopsy, but it doesn't make much sense. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, it shows that it's adenocarcinoma, which is cancer of a tissue. And it appears that the primary is in the lung. And she said, but that doesn't make any sense. And I said, no, that makes no sense. I'm, I'm 25 years old. I don't smoke. I'm, I don't have lung cancer. That's impossible. It, it, was, it was just impossible to me. And she's like, well, it appears that you do. And you're pregnant, so we, don't, we, we can't scan you to see where else it could be by. And she left. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm not crying. I'm, I'm just in total shock. And I remember I was like, I think I need to call my mom to come back. I'm telling this to my husband. So he was back in here at this point. Um, I was like, I need to call my mom. I can't tell her this over the phone. I, I, I can't tell her this over the phone. And so I call her. I'm like, hey, mom, can you come back real fast? And there's nothing real fast about coming back to the hospital from where we live. And she said, okay. And I said, okay. And she gets back. And I said, the doctor came in. And she said that I have lung cancer. I don't know how that's possible. Um, Charles, if you're watching, the dogs are in the front yard scratching at the door. If you would please come and get them. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I love it. Cow right now, we need to figure that out. Um, and so my mom comes back. I tell her, you know, this this oncologist just told me that I have lung cancer, and I don't think that's possible. She's wrong. the The tests are wrong. This isn't possible. Um, we call the nurse in, and we're wanting more answers. And the nurse is like, "I don't know." I was like, "Well, who can we call?" And she said, "It's seven o'clock at night." there's no one you can call right now. We don't know anything more than what the doctor told you. I was like, well, what did the doctor tell me? I have no idea what she told me. Um, and I remember getting angry at that nurse and 
saying, this isn't right. I need to talk to somebody. You don't walk in and tell me I have lung cancer and then leave. And I just remember being so upset that um, it was the end of the day and nobody was there to explain anything to me. And my mom went home or back to our house. And that was the end of it. Um, my dogs are at the front door <laughs> waiting to come in. <laughs> the backyard. Um, so the next day, my OB, my OB comes to the hospital, and I said, "What's happening? Um, this doesn't make any sense." And she's like, no, it doesn't make any sense. And I'm so sorry. And I remember she sat down on the bed and we sat there and we cried together. And she said, when we first um, did the biopsy, we thought this was lymphoma. We had a game plan. Like we would deliver early. You would start treatment. This would be no big deal. And we would move on and you would be fine. I don't know how to handle this. We need to transfer you to a hospital in Dallas. And I said, okay. Or they were trying to decide to transfer me between Dallas and Houston. But like I said earlier, I'm from, um, mm -hmm. I'm from Dallas. So I was like, I'd really prefer to be there because that's where my family is. Mm -hmm. And she said, okay. So I went to Presbyterian of Dallas and they they wanted to transfer me by helicopter. And I remember I was like, you're going to have to give me some anxiety medicine. I'm not getting on a helicopter and I'm not doing that. I like, I will drive myself. We can go by ambulance. I am not getting on a helicopter. And she's like, well, we have to send you by helicopter. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no. <laughs> and so she gave me some anxiety medicine. I was panicking. I did not want on this helicopter. And then a rainstorm came. <gasps> so they let me in my ambulance. But the ambulance had a leak in the roof, so it rained on me the entire way there. <laughs> oh, my God. So I was really, really happy about not being in the helicopter. Yeah. Um, so I get to Dallas. And all of a sudden I have, I mean, it felt like hundreds of people, but it was probably 10 different doctors coming in, just almost like I was a spectacle. Um, and this doesn't make any sense. You're so young. How could you possibly have this? I've never seen anything like this. This is unbelievable. And I, I, I said, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me either. And all the while, I still have a five-year-old at home. And I'm still, I think I was 23 weeks pregnant at this point. Because it had been a few days. Um, I said, I don't know. This doesn't make any sense to me either. And... All the while, my pulse ox level and heart rate, it's getting worse. It's getting worse almost by the hour. And I'm on 10 liters of oxygen at this point. I can no longer have the nasal cannula. They have me on this big contraption. I can't talk because talking completely diminished any way to breathe possible. Um, I was, I couldn't walk to the bathroom um, without help. I couldn't do anything for myself, all in a matter of days. And the oncologist came into the room and he said, uh, Carly, we need to start chemotherapy yesterday. And I said, but I'm pregnant. And he told me I needed to have an abortion. Mm. And I was like, I just don't know if I can do that. Um, and I was like, I don't know if I can even legally do that. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in Texas, you know, and I'm 23 weeks pregnant. That's, I, I, I don't know how I, I, I can't, I can't do this. 
and he was very insistent that it needed to be done. And then I was like, I, I don't know. And so we're, we're all talking, trying to figure out what's going to happen. And the doctor comes back and he said, you are three days past the legal limit for an abortion. And I was like, okay, well, that solves that. So at that point, uh, a maternal fetal medicine doctor came in and he's like, you know, there are risks to chemotherapy, but the baby could be fine. And I was like, okay, well, then let's do this. Um, because the oncologist is also saying at this point, if you don't start chemotherapy now, you're, you're going to be dead in two days. Um, or not dead. He said, you're going to be on a breathing machine, unconscious, and you probably will never wake up from that. So we started chemotherapy, and that was a nightmare in itself, trying to get the IV. And the IV, all my veins were shot at this point, and they so they're calling in a special nurse to put a pick line in my arm at one o'clock in the morning. I don't think I had slept in three days. So I'm in and out of sleep. My mom's in and out of sleep. My husband's in and out of sleep. And, you know, they remember this a lot better than I do. But they finally got the pick line in and they started chemo at probably one o'clock in the morning. And I slept through it. <laughs> and, good. Yes, it's very good. <laughs> I don't remember my first chemo experience. I have no recollection. Um, I don't remember having the pick line put in. I don't remember anything about it. Um, so I had my first chemo. And it was a Friday. So the next day was Saturday. And I remember I had so many visitors coming. Thank you. I had so many visitors coming to see me, and I was so tired. I was absolutely exhausted. And one of my favorite teachers from high school, Mrs. Johnson Profe, she was my Spanish teacher, came and visited me, and um, she said, Carly, I'm praying for you, and I'm I'm sending you all of my extra energy that I have, and I love you, and you're going to be okay. And the next day, I started feeling better. Um, I slowly started weaning down on the oxygen level. I went from being on 10 liters to being on 2 liters of oxygen within about 3 days. And... Not only from my teacher who came to visit me, but the night I had chemotherapy when I was sleeping, my great grandfather, who I was, this, and this is also kind of a side story, but it relates, and I'm going to tie it all together, and it's going to be really important. I was born on my great grandfather's birthday, and I was the first great grandchild. And he always called me his number one great-granddaughter. And we we were close. And I, you know, I adored him. But he passed. And I named my six-year-old. My, he's six now. I named my son after him, David. Um, and he passed away on the 10th of December. And he came to me in a dream. That night I had chemotherapy. And he said, Carly. You're going to be okay. I'm taking care of you, and you're going to be okay. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> and I never believed in that type of stuff before. And prior to this, you know, I was always a Christian. Um, mm -hmm. If you, know, you know what religion are you? I'm like a Christian. I went to Episcopalian school. You know, I occasionally like Christmas, Easter went to church um so i said yeah i'm a christian and after this all it has done is renew not even renew but almost like instill a new 
faith in me. Um, and it's not a feeling that I don't think I can explain. I think it's something, you know, when you're faced in this horrible situation, you can go one of two ways. This is horrible. Why is this happening? And which, you know, I did, you know, I'm going to die. Da, 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 da. Or you can say, this is horrible, but somebody is also taking care of me. And at first it would irk me when people would say, God has you or God has a plan. But now I get it. And I never got that before. But I get it. Um, and so, six days after starting chemotherapy, when nobody thought I was going to leave the hospital, the doctors didn't think I was going to leave the hospital alive. The I remember the pulmonologist, I was kind of in and out of sleep. And when I was asleep, I mean, it was unconscious asleep. And I remember one day when I was sleeping, the pulmonologist came in to talk to my husband. And it wasn't, your wife's going to die. It was you should prepare yourself because everybody thought that, you know, this was my end, but I proved everybody wrong. And I walked out of that hospital six days later on one liter of oxygen. And I went home and, or I went to my mom's house because like I said, we bought a fixer upper and we had to do a little bit more fixing on the house before <laughs> my fragile lungs could return to it. Um, and so I got home, I got to my mom's house and I had an appointment set for eight days from then. I left the hospital on Wednesday and my next appointment was on a Thursday. And when I went to that appointment, I was off of oxygen completely. Wow, that's amazing. I was walking around. Um, I had gone to Hobby Lobby, it's my favorite store, Hobby Lobby, and um, we went to Walmart, and it was difficult. It wasn't getting around easily, but I was getting around where two weeks before I couldn't stand up while I took a shower. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. We get to the appointment Thursday, I'm off of oxygen. And my doctor says, I don't have a way to explain this. Medically, it does not make sense. Um, there's no explanation. The medicine, you know, we all hoped the medicine would work, but the medicine should not have worked this quickly. It should not have worked this well. You should not be sitting here smiling, laughing in front of me, breathing on your own, and fine. It doesn't make sense. There's no explanation for it. Do you have an explanation for it? I smile and I say, yeah, I do. I do have an explanation for it. Um, it was prayer. all those prayers of her energy and it was my family, my friend family. Carly you're you're chopping up again hmm? you're chopping up again real bad let me take a sip of water okay <clears throat> is that any better yeah, yeah. Go we'll keep talking. So go back to the doctor. Said, uh, "Do you have an explanation?" Yeah, the doctor asked me. He said, "Do you have an explanation for this? Because medically, there is no explanation for why you're here, where you are, how you are. There's no explanation." And I said, "Yes, I do have an explanation. It's God. It was prayers." It was my great-grandfather watching over me. It was um, my teacher, Profe. <laughs> if you watch this, 
I credit you, Profe. Um, she sent me all of her energy and good vibes through prayer. And that is why I was okay. And best of all, my baby was okay also. Both of us. Amen. He, um, I'm four foot 11, but my husband is six foot nine. So the baby was measuring really big. <laughs> and we expected him not to measure so big after chemo, but he continued measuring really big. And um, um, at that point, the plan was for me to get to 28 weeks pregnant and then I would deliver. Uh, they would induce me or C-section or whatever they needed to do. But 28 weeks was the goal. And I got to 26 weeks or 27 weeks, and I saw the specialist. And um, if I sit too far back, the volume leaves. But I'll stay forward, okay? Um, I saw the specialist, and he's like, you don't need to deliver at 28 weeks anymore. You're doing great. He's like you could probably go to 34 weeks if you continue. Because at this point, I mean, I was shopping at Sam's Club off of Oxygen. I was, I, I went back to a pretty, I was tired. I was exhausted. But I went back to a pretty normal life. Um, I ran errands. I did what I needed to do. Um, so they're like, yeah, go to 34 weeks. We'll see you later. You know, you're fine. We'll continue monitoring the baby. Um, I continued receiving treatment and then I hit 28 weeks and I went into free term labor on my own. <laughs> so I guess it was just meant to be after my husband and I were trying to figure out how long I was in labor. I swear it was three days. He says it was a little bit less, but I'm sticking with three days, three days of labor, um, at 28 weeks, my son Colton was born. And he weighed two pounds and 13 ounces, which for 28 weeks, that's, that's three months early. 40 weeks is a full-term pregnancy. So mm -hmm. it's three months early. And to be 12 pounds and 13 ounces, he was big. He, <laughs> he was big. And they had, were able to give me the shots I needed to help develop his lungs. Oh, Before, good. Um, he was born. So they intubated him the first night. And then they took the uh, tube out. And he was breathing on his own. Just He had um, a CPAP machine on. But he was on the CPAP on room air. So he was doing really, really well. Especially for as young as he was gestationally. Mm -hmm. And that was the biggest blessing, uh, that he was okay, because nobody expected him to be okay. He had no effect from the chemo, because he went through one round of chemo and two rounds of immunotherapy um, while I was still pregnant with him. And he had no complications at all. Um, and he stayed in the NICU for three months. He was originally due August 26th, and he was born June 7th. So on the 19th of August, he was released from the NICU, and the only real procedure he had to have done the entire time was have one blood transfusion. He had to have one what? Blood transfusion. Oh, okay. Because his iron was low. And it was not super low. They just did it out of an abundance of caution. So okay. that was the only, I mean, don't get me wrong, three months in the NICU, two hours, two and a half hours away from our house while still undergoing treatment and still being pretty sick mm -hmm. was extremely difficult. It was indescribably difficult um but we had some amazing nurses um nurse georgia was you know my favorite nurse and she would i don't want to get her in trouble but she would call me and facetime me while we were at home and i was too sick to go to the NICU so i could see the baby and Aww. she would 
she bought a little onesie for him uh, and surprised us when we went to go see him and he was dressed for the first time because you know normally when you have a baby three months early that premature baby is the focus of your life and that is the worst thing you go through at that time mm -hmm. but for us it wasn't um for us we were still dealing with much bigger and scarier things at home and um Finally, I got a letter in the mail from the doctor, you know, the one who came in at 6 p.m. at night, told me I had lung cancer and then walked out. I got a letter in the mail from her saying that the medic came back and I should be really happy because they found the outputation. See, my shirt. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had an outputation and I should be very happy because this should give me a little bit more time, is what she said in her letter. Um, and at that point, I still hadn't talked with the doctor about prognosis. You know, I, I don't know if it was because I hadn't even considered what stage four lung cancer meant or if I didn't want to consider what it meant, or if I was, you know, just preoccupied with other things, but I had never thought to ask. And so I waited a week for my next appointment with my oncologist, and I had a whole list of questions written out to ask him. And somewhere in the middle, I looked, I had written down, is this comfortable? And I was asked, going through the list, asking questions, and I saw that question, and I was like, mm, I'm not going to ask that, so I skipped to the next one. And he Cardi, was, hold on, honey, there's a lot of interference again. There's a lot of, yeah, I'm hearing a lot of interference, a lot of static. It's like good for a minute, and then it goes away, and then it comes back. Someone thought that it was my microphone, but my microphone's all the way down here, so it's not me. Okay, that sounds better. Now, go ahead. Um, I had the question waiting to be asked, is this overcomable? I didn't know how else to ask it other than, is this overcomable? And my oncologist, his name's Dr. Modi. He's great. I mean, he's really, really just a great person. He's caring. He takes his time. And he looked at me. He's like, this is something you haven't asked me yet. Do you, do you want me to be honest with you? And I said, yeah, I want you to be honest with me. I, I want to know. Um, and he said, I'm sorry, but no, this is terminal cancer. There's um, no remission. There's no cure. There's um, there's treatment options, but they're tough. They're not guaranteed. Uh, with your ALK mutation, you do have more treatment options than, you know, a different lung cancer patient would. And, you know, I'm taking all of this in. I see my mom and my husband sitting in the corner in two chairs, and both of them have tears feel, filling their eyes, and I'm sitting there, tears filling my eyes, and I said, okay, but I don't accept that. Um, you know, I don't tell this to the doctor, but to myself, I was like, I'm not accepting this as my answer. This is not okay with me. This is not the answer I wanted, so that's not the answer I'm going to take. Uh, you are a smart man, but you do not know everything. And uh, <laughs> we walk out of the office, and I hug my mom, and she leaves, and we go back to the NICU, I think, because, you know, our baby's still at the hospital at this point. And... Um, we just kind of look at each other and what are we going to do? What's next? And 
we knew about the ALK mutation. We had no idea what it meant. You know, we're Googling all of these things. And still, when you Google lung cancer, it's not showing people like me. Funny, it doesn't even show people like you. It shows 85-year-old men with, you know, a trach in their neck smoking a cigarette from it, you know. Right, when right. you Google lung cancer, it, it does not show what lung cancer is. Um, so I said, oh, I'm done with Google. <laughs> I'm not Googling anything else. We will take this as it comes. Uh, the social worker at the hospital asked me, do you want me to connect you with other lung cancer patients? And I said, no, I don't. Because still in my mind, I am the only 25-year-old pregnant woman with lung cancer that has ever been diagnosed. No one, no one gets lung cancer, still in my mind. Because my doctors have uh -huh. told me that this is not uncommon. This is not out of the ordinary. I mean, I'm still pretty young. I, I, I am more uncommon than most, but it's not uh -huh. heard of. And that's what I had been told. Um... And so I said, no, I don't want to talk to any other lung cancer survivors. I, I'm not an 85-year-old man. I have no desire. I don't relate to them. I have nothing to say. And not long after that conversation, I was scrolling Instagram. It was the middle of the night. I couldn't sleep. And Instagram is like a safe place because I feel like only happy things are ever posted on Instagram. <laughs> you see, like I... I like the boop your, boop your nose <laughs> pictures of puppies where you tap on their nose and you like it. <laughs> That's the type of stuff I follow on Instagram. And so I was scrolling, booping the noses of little puppies. And I see this post from somebody that I don't even know why I followed them. And it was about his mom having cancer. And my mind's like, Carly, you're about to go into a rabbit hole. Don't read that post. But then something else said, you know, go ahead and read it. And it was a screenshot of a message from somebody named Dan Wilson. And he said, I currently have lung cancer, stage four, ALK mutation. And it was the first time I had ever seen that anywhere other than that, you know, the letter that that mean doctor sent to me saying, this will give you a little bit more time. Um, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is crazy. He's 30 something years old and he has lung cancer just like oh, I do. And so I sent him a message and I'm like, I don't know if you're going to get this. I don't know. Uh, if, you know, I don't know if I'm going to sound crazy, but I have that type of lung cancer also. And I'm young and I'm not a smoker and you're young and you're not a smoker. Why? You know, what, what's going on? And he said, Carly, I am so happy you saw what I wrote you're not alone. We are not alone. If you're on Facebook, you need to go to the Facebook group, Alk Positive, and introduce yourself. And so immediately, I went on and I found the website and I saw stories from people like Courtney Bloodsworth, who was 27 and pregnant when she was diagnosed. And I saw her with a picture of her holding her baby, and I think he was like a year old at that point. And I was like, oh, my God, that, that's me. Um, I saw pictures of tons of other young people. And this was before I was accepted into the Facebook group. I had just seen, you know, the ALK website. Uh -huh. And I said, I'm not alone. And look at all these people. They're healthy. They're happy. They're doing great. Um, This is this is the hope I needed because here are people that I'm saying they're 10 year survivors, they're five year survivors. When in this point, my doctor had still said, you know, you're looking at about nine to 12 months. So I was, you know, it was just this life changing moment at two o'clock in the morning from an Instagram message.
I'm waking my husband up. Look. <laughs> like, look at this story. Look at this story. This is, we're going to be okay. Um, let me take another drink of water. Yes, guys, tell her that she's going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. <laughs> and, um, so I was sending this link to everybody I know, like, Look, I'm not uncommon. This is happening to a lot of people. And yeah, Alyssa, my my papa was busy at work again. That was absolutely a work of God or somebody, a divine in intervention for me to have seen that post and his message and for him to have for my message to him and to reach out. It was absolutely 100% a work of God. And he he has worked in our life so many other ways during this time as far as my husband's job goes. Just the people in our community. We have seen love. And we have seen kindness. And we have seen we've seen the best of people. Um, people that we know, people that were total strangers, we have seen the absolute best of. And we, we've been lucky. And so I joined the ALK group, and I'm so excited. And it renewed hope that I have, I have hope at this point. And... I didn't before. I, you know, I told myself I did, but I had nothing to back up this hope that I was trying to convince myself that I had. But now I do. And I learned about the TKIs. Um, I learned what an electinib was. I learned that there are options for us and that there are hope and that more research is being done. And um, I learned of Dr. Kamage and Dr. Shaw and I saw a quote from one of them, and I'm not going to get it exactly right, but if, you, if you're going to have lung cancer, now is the time to have lung cancer because we have so much hope and all the research that's happening right now. And it's true. We do have hope. And I live every day off of that hope. Um, now, I haven't started Electinip. I didn't start the TKI because I did respond so well to chemo. Good. Um, so I continued with chemo. I lost my hair. But That's okay. I've, I've done the turban. I, you know, I feel like I, I've made the turban work for me. Yes, it looks great. <laughs> I've saved money on shampoo and conditioner. There probably you go. <laughs> um, and time. I mean, we just wrap this around my head and I'm good to go. Um, so, you know, you have to find the positive in that. Of course. Um, so, um, I still have a lot of hope and treatment options alone. Not only just um, hope and God and faith and more research to come, but I have hope and research that's already existing that I haven't started yet. I have hope uh -huh. that still too. So very hopeful. Um, yes. Very. Hopeful. There's lots of hope. Your story. I'm so glad that you reached out to me that you wanted to fill in for Stephanie and you're sharing your story because it is absolutely amazing. Um, and, you know, for, and I'm, I'm one, uh, you know, I'm not saying that I lose faith, but we all go through something in our lives, storms that it just, you know, make us like, Oh God, what is going on? I mean, and then when you hear your story and, and what God did for you, it just, uplifts everyone, believer or non-believers. I don't care 
you know, my non-believer friends, I love you with all my heart, but you got to believe in something. I mean, something exists. And I've always believed about, um, when you had said that you, you never believed about your great grandpa, he came to you and told you, and you know, some people don't. I've always believed in that. Always, always. But it must be a Hispanic thing, or I don't know, because we believe in all that. I believed in it before, um, but only about six months before. Um, I told you I got pregnant in December. We had been uh -huh. trying for a couple of years, and it just didn't happen. And I was, it was the first day possible that I could possibly find out I was pregnant. I had no symptoms, nothing. And I was taking a nap on the couch, and he came to me in a dream, and he's like, Carly, you're pregnant. And I was like, I woke up and I didn't tell my husband. I didn't even tell my best friend. And I went to the store and bought a pregnancy test and it came back positive. And I was just blown away. I was like, that's impossible. And I actually got my husband in trouble at work because I call him at like 3 p.m. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm pregnant. <laughs> and so he forgot and he messed up something at work during that. Um, oops. Um, and he's like, you didn't tell me that you even thought you were. I was like, I didn't think I was. So I believed it was possible, but I didn't, I don't think I had the level of belief in God that I have mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And how he works in our lives. Because you kind of... It's not an obvious, you know, he's, he's not going to be like, God, I want a million dollars and you're going to wake up and find a million dollars on your step. It's going to be, God, I'm so tired and I need help. And then the next day, your husband goes to the tire shop and strikes up conversation with a stranger and they end up living a couple miles from you and they show up at your house the next day and wash your dishes and hold your baby and take care of you and become your support system and your friend. Mm -hmm. That's how God has worked in our life. Total stranger has become somebody who comes over to my house out of just pure kindness of her heart and takes care of me and takes care of my family because, you know, I feel good right now, but it's been two weeks since I had my last chemo treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm norm after chemo, I don't feel this good. You know, tonight I made dinner, got ready to do this, put both of my kids to sleep all before my husband came home from work. And I feel like freaking super mom. But last Thursday, I was in the ER because I was in so much pain. I couldn't sit on my couch without mm -hmm. being in tears from excruciating pain. So I'm still balancing. And, you know, our son came home August 19th. He was born in June, but because he's a preemie, he's still like an eight-week old. Mm -hmm. So I'm balancing having a six-year-old in kindergarten, having an eight-week-old that does not sleep through the night, is a little needy and super grumpy, and it's hard. It is hard. My husband leaves for work every morning by 5 and doesn't get home. He didn't get home till 8 o'clock tonight. So I'm here by myself a lot. Um, my mom works full-time in Dallas. And she's been, a, her employer's been great. It's where, she works where I went to high school and she's worked there 15 years. And they've been pretty mm -hmm. incredible to us too. Um, so we've, that's how God has worked in our life is my mom's been able to take, she's probably taken, she could tell you, she's taken a lot of time off of work to be able to be here and be with me and her employer has been nothing but excellent. And my husband has taken off a bunch of time from work and his employer has been nothing but excellent. And it's 2019 in my husband's line of work. He's only worked there for a year. He's replaceable. They could have fired him saying, nope, you missed too much work. 
but instead they have been there for us. His bosses, I mean, not just his immediate boss, but like his boss's boss's boss um, came and visited us in the hospital with his wife. They had gone through cancer when she was pregnant. She had lymphoma, you know, the cancer I thought I had um, when she was pregnant 20 years ago. And so she's come to our house and helped and just all these people have been put in our life and have been so kind and so generous and so thoughtful. Um, you know, I keep mentioning strangers, but that's not even to begin to list our friends who have been kind and thoughtful and helpful to us. Um, Yes, you are, you are very blessed. It's humbling. Very blessed. Mm -hmm. And um, that's amazing because, you know, the, if the world, if we all were just nicer and more kind, and if we just show love no matter what, this world will be a better place. But unfortunately, everyone's not like that. You have eighth of the amount of love I have received the past six months, the world would be an amazing place. Yes. I can yes. imagine if I agree. the amount I have received was everywhere. Uh. Yes, I agree. And it's sad that our world can't be that way. You know, it's sad. Uh, there's times that I cry because I'm like, I just wish people were nicer, people were more kind. People just love. If you just love, I don't care where you're from. I don't care the color of your skin. I don't care what religion you are. I don't care if you're straight or homosexual. I don't care. You have to display love, 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 and be kind because that's what the word says. The word doesn't say, oh, you can't love that person because, you know, she's lesbian or he's gay. You can't love that person because he's Muslim or She's this, you know, Buddha. No, that, it, the word does not say that. The word says to love my people because they're still God's people. We have to love murderers and rapists. That's what I, and I was just having this conversation with someone at my gym. I say, you know, if we just love, <clears throat> you know, and just show love and just be kind, this world will be a better place. It's none of your business what that person is. It, it, that's between them and God. You let God handle that. But you, as a servant of God, a believer and a servant of God, you're supposed to display what God would do. And he would love and would be kind and would lend a hand out. And people just don't get it. You know, even other religions don't get it. And it's like, okay, what Bible are you guys reading? Because the Bible that I read, <laughs> that's what it teaches. So... Um, your 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 story is just so, uh, oh God, it's just so uplifting, so amazing. Just, um, I was trying not to cry, and and I know everyone. Cry. It's okay. You let it out. It's your story. You have every right to cry. Tears of joy, though. And you know, of course, your doctors or oncologists, whatever, they're gonna tell you. You know, they gave me eighteen months. Back, and this is almost five years ago, next month. And I was only stage 3B. And they gave me 18 months, and I told them, what? I said, no. I ain't going nowhere. You don't know the God that I serve. You know what they told me? They go, oh, if that's what you believe in. And I proved them all wrong. You're damn right that's what I believe in. And I'm here today. About myself. You want to? Too stubborn to die. Yes, exactly. I'm not going nowhere. I'm not going to prove them anything. <laughs> I'm just going to prove right. them. Yes. And more and more of us are living, are hitting that five-year mark. Now, it's not where I want it to be because our survival rate for five years, I think right now is at 23%. And it jumped up from last time. It was only 18. So it jumped up. But we got to get it up there like breast cancer. Breast cancer is almost 100%. For a five-year survival rate, we we're gonna get there. Oh, we are gonna get there, one way or another. We're getting there. <laughs> we're gonna get there. Um, and while I'm still breathing, I'm gonna be a part of that to make that happen. With all me complaining and yelling and screaming about awareness and 
and stopping the stigma and and educating people and you know you know just just uh, making noise to our government about research funding and all that yeah i'm not gonna stop until you know we get what we need to get and you know until or until god calls me home so tired i need to kind of get over this newborn hump <laughs> yeah <laughs> too but we plan on attending the conference in dc in april which awesome. actually has a one year cancer anniversary and i feel like that's kind of a sign uh, yeah. that i need to be there um it falls to the day of my one year cancer diagnosis yes um, yes but i'm going to be there they said i would be dead but i'm not going to be dead i'm going to be like, sightseeing and learning how to advocate and That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. I'll be looking forward to meeting you and your husband and um so going back to, you know, having a dream of your great grandpa, I like I said I truly believe in that because when I was diagnosed and I was going through, I started off with traditional chemo and radiation. Um I had friends that called me, text me and told me I had a dream. I had a dream that you called me or I, no I can't remember. I think it was my my cousin's wife says I had a dream that you that either I called her or that she just heard in her dream that I was that I was I had no more cancer. So you know we call it Ned. Um I don't say cancer free or remission and I call it Ned, no evidence of disease. And then I had another friend that messaged me through Messenger and told me she had a dream that she saw Because I started off at Cancer Treatment Centers of America, she said that she was dreaming that she was watching TV and she saw the commercial, and then she saw me, and she felt in the dream that God was telling her, um, "Tell Juanita that everything's going to be okay, that she's going to be." So she messaged me to tell me that, and it was just little signs that I was getting from people from dreams. So I knew, I knew, and I truly believe in that. And then one of my good friends, um she's also a a powerful woman of God. She's the one that got me um taught me about about God and and how, you know reading the Bible and how it works because I was you know raised Catholic and not to put the Catholic religion down, but they don't teach you that. They don't teach you, you know, how to pray really or or how to read the Bible and understand it and and break it down and explain it to you. So, um when she came and she started showing me and we started having bible study and then i started going to a non-denomin non-denominational church that's where i started learning and growing and i never forget she came to my house and she goes i had to come and visit you i'm like okay i'm glad you're here i was lonely what's up you know she sat down with me we're talking and she goes god wanted me to give you a message and i said okay what is it she said it was the book of genesis the very first book the very first verse i think and then uh oh god what was it? i don't even know i mean i know the the word i just don't know like where exact but i could i could say them um and she's like god wanted me to tell you i think it was the first verse and then um there was darkness and then there was light and i'll never forget i looked at her like she was crazy i'm like what and i was like okay and i didn't get it at all i didn't get what she meant i'm like why is god telling her to tell me in the, in the book of genesis there was darkness and then there was light so i still wasn't getting it i didn't get it for nothing so then one time we were at my house and there was four of us or three of us and we were having bible study and they're talking you know we're reading a verse and talking about it whatever and all of a sudden out of nowhere i scare them and i scream like oh I got it. And then one of the girls jumped up and then my friend was like, "You got what?" I said, "What you told me." She goes, "Okay." She goes, "What was it?" Cuz there was darkness and then there was light. I'm in darkness with lung cancer. I'm sad, I'm depressed. I'm not looking forward. Um I'm scared, I'm angry. I have all this. I feel like I'm in darkness, but he's telling me, "Right now you're in darkness, but don't worry, at the end of that tunnel there's light." you're going to see light. He's telling me that I'm getting my healing. I just got it like out of nowhere. And she told me this like maybe about a month prior. And then yes, it took me that long to get it, but I I I didn't I wasn't how I interpreted 
she planted that seed then. And then once I was being, it was being watered, God was going to uh, reveal it to me. And he did a month later, but that's okay. And I got it. I was like, oh my God. I, and I, and then she goes, that's, she, but she didn't, all she told me was the verse. She didn't go into it. So I was like, okay. And then, so I got it. So he revealed it to me. And that's when I knew. I was like, and all that fell into place. And I knew then, and I knew prior to that, but you know, we're human. We have a little doubt, a little fear, but I knew that everything was going to be okay. And I was going to see all my kids graduate and I got them to see high school, some college. I got to see 50. I travel a lot. And, you know, I was never, they told me, you'll never, you'll never get to meet any of your grandkids. And there was one lady at a church that came up to me. I don't know her from Adam. Didn't know her. And I remember that morning I went to church crying. And I said, Lord, I said, let me at least meet one grandchild. At least one. Give me that. And I remember praying it, you know, and then thanking him and giving him praise and glory. Some stranger. But I still had. I was a baby Christian. I was still having little doubts here, little fear. And this total stranger comes up to me and she grabs me and she goes, I have to tell you something. I'm like, okay. You know, she goes, God wanted me to come and tell you, you are going to meet your grandchildren. I started crying and I have a granddaughter and I have many more to meet. So that, you know, I've always believed in it. So when you told me that, I was like, oh, my God, you know, you know, there's some churches or some, you know, religion that say, oh, no, that's not God. That's demons or whatever. I mean, everyone interprets that. I don't care. I believe in it. You got it. Your grandpa told you it happened. I'm sorry. I believe in it. You know, and others might disagree. And that's fine. You know, well, how does what does that saying goes? Agree to disagree or something like that. That's fine. You know, you could, you could say, I don't believe in that. That's fine. I do. I truly believe that, um, that, you know, our loved ones come to us in dreams and either warn us or talk to us or to give us messages. And if not like your grandpa, great grandpa did to you, but maybe through others, you know, I truly believe in that. So I just wanted to share that with you that, yes, I believe in that. And your, your great grandpa was, right there watching you and making sure that you were going to be okay and you are praise god yeah so it's it's a miracle and i feel very blessed and you know part of me is sad that it takes being diagnosed with such a horrible unfair disease to feel this way but then another part of me is lucky that I do get to feel this way. You know, I don't know what the future holds. Um, I hope and I pray and I'm expecting the best, but I feel lucky that I'm able to feel this way now. I hope I continue to feel this way for a very long time. And, um, but you know, there's always a chance that that's not possible. And, you know, that's a reality that I do live with. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that, that that still is a fear. You know, I can sit here all day and say, I'm going to survive. I'm going to live. But, you know, there's still the chance that I won't. And, you know, that's something that I struggle with. Um, but I'm comforted by the fact that if something does happen to me, that I am doing well now. Mm -hmm. And I am learning to appreciate things that I did not appreciate before. I am learning to love in ways I did not know before. And most important in my life and in this journey for me so far is I have learned forgiveness. Um, and I think that's an important thing to talk about to other survivors. And, you know, I could continue to live. It's unrelated. Bad things happened in the past. You know, people left. Bad situations happened. And I've lived with that anger and 
opaque for a really mm -hmm. long time. And since this diagnosis, I have learned to forgive, to truly forgive, not like, oh, I forgive you, but truly within my own heart to forgive. And I feel like because of this diagnosis is the reason I've learned to do that. And I feel very blessed to have that forgiveness and to have that peace and to know that for the rest of my life, however long it may be, I'm living it well. And I uh -huh. hope I am teaching my children to live it well. Um, and I hope I can teach others to live it well. You have this precious, precious life, and we have to start doing better and being better. And it starts with yourself and showing people kindness and forgiveness. And, yes. and I think that's the most important lesson I've learned through. And, you know, there's times where I don't live up to what I'm saying. I make mistakes. I was having a bad day and yelled at a Walmart cashier a few weeks ago because I was angry and having a bad day. Um, but I knew I did wrong, and I, I promised myself I would do better. And I don't think that's something that I had before. So, you know, right. with this horrible diagnosis also comes a lot of good things. And I think that that's important to realize. Um, but not everything with the cancer diagnosis is terrible. Some things have been pretty great. Yes. And I wouldn't have that had I not been diagnosed. Yes. So. I agree. Oh, my goodness, Carly. Thank you so much for sharing your story. It's just so... Oh. It's, everyone everyone is commenting how how your story is amazing how uplifting it is everyone just loves your story so thank you so much uh, when you reached out to me um what was it yesterday right when i posted was it yesterday yeah and i said oh i said like I, she canceled anyone wants to and you said i'll do it i was like oh thank you lord <laughs> i was like thank you lord i got somebody so thank you so much for sharing this amazing story and and yes, you're gonna have you're gonna help people, you're gonna uplift people, you're gonna show them how to love more, how to be more kind and more forgiving. Uh, you're gonna do that, um, you know, and just remind us every day, <laughs> even on Facebook, remind, even remind me, because sometimes I lash out too, and I'm like, oh God, this is not a God wouldn't do this. What am I doing? But we're human, so you we know, it happens, we're human. It and happens. so, but thank you. Yes. Yes, but thank you so much for sharing um, your story. Um, and, and make sure, viewers out there, make sure you share this story. Her story is amazing, so share it because others got to hear this. I know it's a little choppy every now and then, but it's still you still could hear. Um, so make sure you share this. And uh, I will put it on YouTube for those that, um, that you know that this will touch someone and they don't have Facebook. It will be on YouTube. So just send them to my YouTube channel so they could view um, this video as well. And I'm looking forward to meeting you, Carly, in April in D.C. Me too. We'll talk sooner than that, though. Yes, of course. Yeah, you got my number now. Call me, text me whenever you want. Okay. Well, thank you so much for giving us all the platform to share our stories. Yes. And thank you. you have a good night. And um, and we'll talk soon. Sounds good. Okay. okay. And my viewers, thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your kind and uplifting words uh, for that you send uh, me and Carly. We truly appreciate it. So good night, everyone. Love you guys, and God bless you. I'll see you soon.